evening and welcome to the Thursday, October 24th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm David Narkowitz, the chair of the committee, and I'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll call. Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Ms. Molly Garner? Present. Ms. Rebecca Busansky? Here. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Susan Boss? Present. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, the primary purpose of tonight's uh, meeting is a presentation of the MCAS uh, results for the district, but we do have one field trip uh, request uh, that we needed to get approved um, because it is timely. Um, uh, would someone please make a motion to approve this field trip on November 12th, 2019 of Leeds Third Grade going to the Pequot Museum and Research Center? So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded. Um, any discussion about that? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving that field trip, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And now we will turn to Dr. Provost and his report on District MCAS results. Thank you very much. Say goodbye. Yeah. Before I start, Annie, if you could pass out the protocol we use for these student success meetings, just so people have that in front of them. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I think I should just start by admitting that I like data, um, maybe a little bit farther um, field in this than some of the other employees of the district as I'm often reminded um, but and I will say this that I, I believe in having making data informed decisions rather than data driven decisions there's a lot of um, talk in many of the documents on on school leadership and school reform about being data driven and I think that data really just gives you information and so it shouldn't be the lone driver I think it's your, your values that drive you your data can tell you who's flourishing and who's not flourishing, but it's your values that tell you whether you care about that and whether or not you should do something about it. Um, so uh, I'm hoping to have a data-informed discussion tonight um, that can help um, us lead to some data-informed decisions or, or for me to share with you some data-informed decisions that I'm making. Um, just a, a moment on the graphic. You know, whenever I present one of these, I always have a graphic that um, tries to represent something. And so here are train tracks, not just because it's Northampton and we love trains, um, but because the trains are going in all different directions. And I think you'll see as you look through the data, we have some student groups that are moving in different directions. And so it's a very um, sort of nuanced picture of student achievement. And that's what um, I hope to just alert you to as we start. So first piece of information, um, as you know, it's always been my practice to look at us in comparison to our peer districts. And due to changing um, demographics, we've had some changes in our peer districts. So Cambridge, East Hampton, and Weymouth have joined us as three peer districts, and they're replacing Hudson, Saugus, and South Hadley that are no longer considered peer districts for Northampton. Um, the three demographics that the, the algorithm matches on is percent economically disadvantaged, percent of students with disabilities, and percent English language learners. And if you look at the table, you can see that they are replacing um, some of our lower ec economically disadvantaged former peer districts with new peer districts that have higher rates of economic disadvantage, rep replacing um, districts that had lower numbers of students with disabilities with um, districts that have higher numbers of students with disabilities, and um, replacing 
districts that had higher numbers of ELL <coughs> with districts that have lower numbers of ELL. So if you're wondering for 2019, which is the year that we're matching districts on, Northampton had 26.5% economically disadvantaged, 21.5% students with disabilities, and 3.7% English language learners. So you can see those new districts coming in are uh, sync up pretty closely with the district as a whole. Um, the schools have individual um, peer schools as well, and they have all changed. Um, with six, there's no way to really sort of conveniently show all the different 180 peer schools and the schools moving in and schools moving out. But I thought it would be helpful to show where the um, demographics were in 2019. You can see that Bridge Street continues to be the school that has the highest number of economically disadvantaged students. This is not um, new information. Um, it's something that was um, very much on the school committee's mind when we were doing budgets a few years ago and decided to direct more resources to bridge to deal with their higher number of economically disadvantaged students. And that continues to be the case and as you see continues to grow. Um, also point out that the number of English language learners has grown significantly at Bridge Street School. So that is a school that continues to um, experience some, some very um, very high needs population students. Um, and you can also see that we continue to have this, um, this sort of bifurcation in our district where the elementary schools have much higher needs than the high school and the middle school is kind of somewhere in, in the middle. Um, looking at how things are changing, I'd say that Leeds Elementary School is um, experiencing the fastest change at this time. Um, so looking just year to year change in terms of their um, groups, and again, these are the groups that they match on for peer schools. Leeds has increased its economically disadvantaged students 6.1%, students with disabilities 3.5%, and did have a decrease in its English language learners. Um, see, JFK was relatively stable, as was the high school, and then um, there, the other elementary schools had some ups and downs. Bridge Street also had a um, significant increase in its students who were economically disadvantaged, um, but is, is seeing a decrease in its number of students with disabilities. Um, Jackson Street is a school that, um, as you, if you compare to the prior sheet, you can see that its number of economically disadvantaged and students with disabilities is relatively lower compared to other elementary schools and continue to see a decrease in numbers of economically disadvantaged students past year. So the, what that means is that just like the peer districts for the district as a whole changed, the peer schools for each of the individual schools changed. And so you'll see um, comparisons to the peer schools later on. Also, we had some changes in the test this year. Um, so this is the first time we administered Next Generation MCAS for grade 10 ELA and math. Also the first time we had a Next Generation MCAS for science in grades five and grade eight. So that means that the only legacy test still out there is high school science. Everything else has been converted over to Next Gen. Um, and uh, it's important to point out that the, even though grade 10 is now taking next gen like three through eight, the grade 10 scores are not comparable to the three through eight scores. They're on a different scale. So you really have two district averages to think about, one for grades three through eight and one for grade 10, which is why um, those, those uh, two different grade levels are, are treated differently in this analysis. So um, the peer districts for grades three through eight were slightly below average to slightly above average. Um, you can see there was a placeholder there that I forgot to get back to, but I know the answer now. Um, the peer districts in grade 10 were slightly below average to slightly above average. So what that means is um, the statewide average is an appropriate uh, measure for Northampton. Um, 
you'll see that the peer group averages in most areas are slightly below the statewide average. Um, so in general, districts and schools that have the population that our district and schools have do a little bit worse than the average, um, statewide average. Um, but you'll see how we compare to our individual schools. The other thing that I want to say before I um, get in, well, actually, I'll, I'll save, I'll save um, what I want to say about the actual scaled score conversion until we get to the school by school averages. So the first type of, first type of analysis we have here are just looking at each of the subgroups at each of the schools and the entire spectrum of scores. So one of the things that I've found is that it's, um, as I've done this more and more, I've realized that looking at measures of um, central tendency can be really deceiving. And if you can visual the whole, um, the whole range of scores, you should try to visualize the whole range of scores. So that's what you'll see in this next um, piece. There is a, a second piece of this where I do look at um, average scores. Um, but you sort of lose all the nuance of how many kids are in the bottom, how many kids are in the top, you know, how wide is are your middle groups. Um, but you do have that for this. Uh, so in all of these sheets that are coming forward, um, you have the four scoring categories on next gen MCAS represented by four colors. Red is not meeting expectations. Orange is partially meeting expectations. Green is meeting expectations. And blue is exceeding expectations. And all of these, you have the schools lined up. You don't have the high school, because as I said, the high school is on its own scale. Um, but then you have the peer district average and the statewide average. And these go subgroup by subgroup. So um, when we're looking at grades three through eight students with disabilities, we're looking at the peer district average in grades three through eight for the students with disabilities subgroup, and the statewide average in grades three through eight for the students with disabilities subgroup. I should say also um, another note on, of interpretation with this. There is a change that took place last year that um, needs to really be um, sort of taken into account whenever considering middle school scores. Um, prior to two years ago, middle school was its own group. Um, so you had elementary schools, middle, and high. Um, two years ago, the decision was made at the statewide level that middle schools are elementary schools. So now, middle schools are compared with the el elementary schools. Um, however, they perform quite differently than the middle schools, I'm sorry, than the elementary schools. So, um, and in general, middle schools do worse than elementary schools. So you see that for our district. Um, the, the sort of um, balance against that is when you look at peer school comparisons, and you can see how JFK does in comparison to the middle schools that are like it. Um, but anyways, this first um, graph is English language arts, grades three through eight, the students with disabilities subgroup. This is grade three through eight, English language arts again, and non-disabled students. This is English language arts three through eight, high needs students. This is three through eight, non-high needs students. three through eight Hispanic and Latino students. Grades three through eight white students in English language arts. Um, just a note on there are obviously other racial subgroups within the district, but um, the Hispanic and Latino and white subgroups are the two largest subgroups in the district. They are the two groups that every school has enough students to form a subgroup in. Um, so the fact that other subgroups are not represented here is not meant to um, imply that they don't exist within our district. But 
we can't generate data from them because at the school level, in many schools, there's not enough students to make a subgroup. So that's why we're looking at these two subgroups. Yes? How many students does it take to make a subgroup? 20. Thank you. So subgroup is 20 or more? Yes. Okay. And the reason for it is there's no rule of small numbers. If you get a, a subgroup that's that tiny, the performance of one or two students becomes um, able to really change the performance of the subgroup. So um, it's not really appropriate to analyze groups that are that small. <coughs> OK, so then moving on to math. Um, this is mathematics, three through eight students with disabilities. This is three through eight non-disabled students. This is three through eight high need students. Three through eight non high need students. Three through eight Hispanic and Latino students. Three through eight white students. Then we'll move into science. Um, Bridge Street drops out, again, for the reason of forming a subgroup. Science is only given in grade five, and there were not enough students with disabilities in grade five at Bridge Street last year to form a subgroup, so it disappears. This is science non disabled. Science high needs. Science non high needs. Hispanic and Latino students. And here, all the elementaries fall out because in grade five, there's not enough students to form a subgroup for Hispanic and Latino. But there was enough for JFK. So I felt it was worth keeping it in to see that. And then white students. Okay, so moving on to grade 10. As I said, that um, really operates in its own realm. So this is comparing just grade 10 to grade 10. This is next gen MCAS results. So this is high school. Yes. Do you mind if I ask you one question? Sure. Um, for the three to eight, you talked about this, and I think it might just be worth asking now. The middle school, on average, across the state has a different average than the elementary schools. Yes. And as we go through this, and I'm trying to think about how to compare the elementary schools and the middle school to the state average, um, is it even possible to? Is it? Um, I guess what I'm saying is it feels to me, based on what you said, is I, I understand they don't do it this way, but if you had a state average for three to five, that would be comparable to our elementary schools and then a state average for middle school. But if they're on two different scales, how do we, how do we think about that state average? So I, I think of it in terms of um, needing to have the individual school comparisons as sort of the balance point to that, but also pointing out, so you are, you are still pulling in the rest of the, the schools that are in that range into the average, right? So that average was calculated with middle school students in it. So you can't really take all of the middle school students out from your own sample. You know what I mean? I do. I guess what would this be true if our middle school 
performs poorly compared to the state average on lots of measures, that might be true of all middle schools. That, I would say, is true of many middle schools. And that's what I think is bothering me. Yes. Because it would be easy to conclude our middle school is performing below average, but the average is really messed up from all of these what, other things. I think the best way to say it is that they're performing below average for three to eight schools, yeah. but not necessarily below average for middle schools. Would the DART tool for comparable schools looking at JFK's profile give you a sense at least of the comparables? I mean, because I'm yeah, just looking. That, that's I'm, actually coming up later on. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Want. Thanks. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that as we're yeah. going through them. Because. Yeah. Um, and I, just in my own conversations with the department around that, I think they, that decision was made to, to sort of move the middle schools into the K to eight range because they want to put some more pressure on middle schools to change. Um, and so, you know, putting them in with higher performing schools will create a sense of urgency to make reforms at the middle school level. So anyways, um, 10th grade, this is students with disabilities, us and our peer districts in the state. Non-disabled students. I need students. Non-high needs. Hispanic and Latino students. White students. And here comes math, students with disabilities. Non-disabled students. I need students. Non-high needs. Hispanic and Latino. White. And I believe we go to science. Students with disabilities. Non disabled students. Now I need Spanish and Latino. So here's where we get to the individual school comparisons. And in each of these, the large blue dot represents the Northampton school. And the rest of the dots are the other comparable schools in the group. And you can see the comparable schools listed. They change um, from school to school because each of them have such a unique profile. I think there's one school that appears as a peer for two of our, our Northampton schools. Um, but that, that's it. Um, and none of the Northampton schools are considered peer schools for each other. Um, so what I want to say about this, um, just an important point in understanding the scale score conversion. Um, an item on the test is worth approximately two scale score points. Um, so when you're looking at just Let's say the non-disabled range there that 
goes from about 500 to 516, let's say, that that would be um, that would be eight eight actual questions on the test from the average in the lowest school to the average in the highest school. On um, on all of these tests, 500 is set as the cut score for passing. So the green line shows you how close the group is above or below the cut score for passing. And you can see its comparison to its comparable school. So you see the spread and you see the score in relation to passing. And then you can see all the subgroups listed across the bottom. So you can see how non-disabled students at Bridge Street do compared to the non-disabled students in its peer schools, students with disabilities, non-high needs, high needs, white, and Hispanic or Latino. So same thing, and just looking at the peer schools. Yes? Can you remind us brief de definition of non-high needs versus high needs? High needs is an amalgam group by definition. So that, to be in high needs, it means that you either are an economically disadvantaged student, student with a disability, or an English language learner. Um, so, so sometimes a student is more than one of those, but having just one of any of those categories means you're high needs. And then non-high needs means you don't fit into any of those categories. So this is English language arts at Bridge Street. This is mathematics at Bridge Street. This is science at Bridge Street. And some of the dots disappear because in fifth grade there weren't enough students in the group to make a subgroup for Bridge Street. You see that happen for some of the other schools too, which is why there are fewer dots in students with disabilities and Hispanic and Latino. Here is Jackson Street. It's schools. And here's Jackson Street, math. And Jackson Street, science. is Leeds English Language Arts. You can see that its peer schools um, and in general are in a different category. Um, I believe Cambridge Port is one of its peer schools. Um, so they're competing with different schools because their demographics are um, not as challenging as some of the other demographics in the district. Here's math. And science. Yeah. Here's Ryan Road. And Ryan Road Math. On this one, I don't know why this happened and I couldn't get it to switch, but the racial groups went to the front. On the other slides, they were in the back. This is science. Now, the question more was I'm sorry. <coughs> Mr. Meyer was asking regarding JFK. Here's JFK versus its comparable middle schools. In 
English language arts. And in math. And in science. So I think that kind of balances that picture. Then here's the high school, English language arts. And math. And this next one coming up, remember, science is still on the old system, it's legacy. So on this, it's not an average scaled score. It's the composite proficiency index, which is a number going from 0 to 100. If every student who gets um, proficient or advanced gets 100 points on that. Um, so this is what it looks like in science. Yes. Can I ask you about that? Sure. So when you look at the, the legacy MCAS in science, it, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it looks like we were doing exceptionally well on that. Um, am I wrong to think that the, the newer version will be more difficult? No. And so I feel like that's something that the public should be aware of, that, you know, part of, part of the problem is that we have been improving and then they make the test more difficult, that they keep moving the finish line that's right. and raising the bar for our students. And so I just think that that's an important point to make, that when you look at these, the high school science scores, I think they're very impressive um, and they're, even more impressive than our peer districts in the state. And it's a shame that I don't know what the future will bring, but um, but that they will continue to make it more difficult. Um, so I, I have a, a two responses to that. One is um, every other subject and grade has already been through that. Um, maybe my first response should be, I agree with you that it's a little bit maddening. And the reason that it's being done is maddening to me too. The reason that that change is being made is because if you look, for example, at the non-disabled group where you have a bunch of dots all basically bumping up against the top, um, the test is no longer able to separate schools. So one way of interpreting that is maybe we've taught the standards to mastery and it could be okay if everyone was, you know, actually performing at that level. Um, but the department has said that it needs to be able to separate schools. So it needs a test that shows who's doing relatively better or worse than other schools. And when every school is doing well, the only way to spread them out again is to make the test harder. Um, so that's that's the maddening part of it. Um, the the part of it that I I think. Um, I feel good about though is these two slides. Look at English language arts and math. Um, we actually did pretty well in that spreading process. So this is the first time we had English language arts at the high school. And you can see in on the, on the next gen MCAS, you can see for most of these groups, with some exceptions, which I want to talk about, we're right at the top of our peer group. In math, we are right there with our peer group in, with the exception of students with disabilities, high needs and Hispanic and Latino students. And, you know, some of those schools that are in our peer group are extremely well resourced schools. So, Swamp um, Scott. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I guess I see it a little differently. I think it's incredibly maddening that we have high stakes tests that are going to determine whether these high schoolers are going to graduate or not. I think raising the bar in general is a really good thing. And so I can't really argue with that part of like testing 
and if everyone's bumping closer to the top, then you know we should anyway. That's not, but obviously, the high—it's the high-stakes nature that really that's, that's, makes it yeah. so kind of dangerous. I think, in a way. So that's right. right. Yeah, thank you. Because that's the part that I was going to was where you see that it's the subgroups that are being impacted negatively, and it's the high-stakes nature of it that I find a little bit problematic. And so the the last piece I have to share with you before I sort of turn it over to your reflections. Well, actually, yeah last piece before reflections is we now have three years of data with this new test in most grades so just looking at what that's like so this is just looking at the percent meeting or exceeding expectations in English language arts this is all students and this is grade by grade so you can see how things are going in third fourth fifth sixth seventh and eighth grade um, not the same students obviously because it's a new grade every year but you can get a sense if there's a trend that's all students And this is mathematics, all students. This is English language arts, students with disabilities. Mathematics, students with disabilities. Language arts, high needs. Mathematics, high needs. English language arts, economically disadvantaged. Mathematics, economically disadvantaged. English language arts, Hispanic or Latino. It's white. Mathematics, white. And then, okay, I'll save that later. Okay, so that's all I have for data tonight. Um, <laughs> now it's, I'm so glad that's all you have for data. <laughs> um, so now it's time for our our Atlas protocol. So um, the first part of this is just describing the data. What do you see? And then the focus on this is just to say, in any of those graphs, charts, um, different ways of looking at data, what did you notice without really interpreting it or getting into implications? And we usually just well, I mean, I guess I noticed we have not closed the achievement gap. That our subgroups pretty much across the board are doing much worse, with some exceptions, but doing much worse than our uh, non-high needs, or white groups, etc. That's what stood out to me. There's probably other examples, but I was looking through to see where we were really doing well with meet, with exceeding expectations, and two areas that stood out were science at the high school and science at Leeds. And there may be more, but those stood out to me. Um, it did stand out to me that, uh, you know, uh, in the first, in comparing school, Northampton schools to each other, that JFK is 
definitely having you know more challenges not doing as well so maybe later you could just speak to why do middle schools perform so differently when I was looking at this before the meeting I didn't have that piece of information so that would be helpful in understanding those numbers and I'd also be curious what uh, what you think of our new peer groupings, especially in the second where you compare us to the when we're compared to the other peer schools? What do you do? You think those are good? I don't know. What do you okay, think so, those compare? So yeah. So then, since that's a question rather than an observation, I'll just um, answer that. Uh, so I, I will tell you what my own um, what my own temptation is and ask you to help guard me from it because I've already said it a couple times and I'm not sure if I should have said it um, which is that if Cambridge is in our group that our goal should be to beat Cambridge right um, which I think is to me kind of an inspiring thing and in some places it's possible in some places some limited places we're already beating them um, but that could be vanity Right, so, because um, one thing we know is they're spending almost twenty thousand dollars per student, um, which is a much different um, scenario than we have. But um, but I do think I do think it was right to take out South Hadley. I do think it was right to take out um, some of those other districts that were really much less needy than us. Um, so I think that part is good. Uh -huh. um, and I really think that, uh, I really think that, I think the science pattern is bigger. I think if you look across the board, science um, is, the, is the area of strength for us. And we have surpassed a lot of the Cambridge schools in science. Um, so maybe it, it isn't so beyond the pale to say maybe we can do it in English language arts and math too. Um, but I just, I just put it out there that it may be a little bit of an unfair comparison based on the inequity of resources available. Thank you. She can go first. So I just thought it was interesting that for English language arts, uh, grades three to eight for nine high need students, that um, more than a quarter, yeah, more than a quarter of students at Ryan Road were exceeding expectations, that they were performing well beyond um, both peer districts and the state. Nick, we have studio. What's that? Did you have your hand? No, no, no. I was no. Would you mind putting the slide up for the high school with these kinds of, <laughs> um, what did Downey call them, the DART data? The, the scatter plots. Yeah. I don't know what, yeah. So I guess I'm building on what Rebecca said in terms of the achievement gap, and there's different, maybe, for me, it really stood out as if I'm defining achievement gap as bringing different groups together, um, it's even stronger if you look at this in terms of us not doing a good job because we're doing really well compared to our comparison schools for our traditionally more privileged groups and we're doing extremely poorly like it, an achievement gap could be the average of each of these but we're actually at the top in our privileged groups and we're tending to be at the bottom in our not privileged groups and the same is true for math so it's even a multiplier on that achievement gap in a sense does that make sense yes mm -hmm. yeah I mean so just to build on that, so we're to take for Hispanic and Latino students, for example, because we're looking at them right now, um, we're low compared to our peer schools. Right. And um, we're high compared to our peer schools and white students. That's exactly what I'm, yeah. Exactly. That's and, exactly. And the two groups aren't equal to each other to begin with. Exactly. So, right, yes. Can we look at the math one too while you're here? I think it might even be more. Yeah, it's similar. Mm -hmm. 
But the science. Goes science is different. Yeah. Science is different. Yeah. Yes. And I was noticing that, that this is, I think it's strange, and I don't quite understand what this, how different the science results are than the math and the English results. Just because I don't know how you do science without math and English, and so it's just surprising to me that you know we have groups. It, generally, all of the, all of the every single group, whether it, whichever grade level and whichever, you know, whichever comparison, the math and the English sort of tend, tend to be sort of kind of some sort of relational thing and then the science is really different and you know in terms of the scores and I just it just strikes me as curious you know it's like are they written tests written by different people you know I mean really different people because <laughs> they just come out to such different kind of way of testing so I think that's a good point to pivot to the second type of um, responses which are um, and the protocol which are more interpretive um, like asking, so why is that? Now that we've seen it, what could that mean? Do we have um, the data disaggregated for our Latino students that are PLL learners, that are like English language learners? No, we don't because in most places there are not enough ELLs to make a subgroup. But I can tell you that most of our Hispanic and Latino students are not ELLs. Any comments or just on this? No, any comments. Any comments um, of the, the int more interpretive type? So there isn't a plot. If you could put this kind of thing up maybe for the Bridge Street School for math or PLL, English language. Yeah. OK. So. I think I said this once before. It's I understand each of our elementary schools has a different comparison group, but I think it's also beneficial to look across our four elementary schools since we're all, you know, in some sense they have similar curriculum, they have similar resources from our district, not identical. And um, I wrote on my paper here, but that might be a plot we could look at at some point or next time include. But Bridge Street. What I'm noticing is Bridge Street is continuing to lag behind in each of those, the, and, and pretty substantially. And then there's some other areas, depending on what, it's complicated enough, depending on math or English language. But, but there's some really big differences between our elementary schools in all of these. Is that making sense? So I guess I'd, that's just something that I think we should see if we can learn from. So for example, if one school is doing a lot better across the board in math, are they doing things differently than another school? Is, are there things we can learn from it? And, and I don't mean preparing for the MCAS. I just mean right. you know, so is, is that, a child's experience there. Are you, are you just throwing it out, or are you looking at probing to see if I have any hypotheses I'm in that area? I'm just throwing it okay. out. I, I guess I'm struggling with. There's a lot of data here, and what do we do with it, and what are we, where are we trying to get with it? And so that's one thought I'm having in terms of something that might come out of it. If presumably, the different elementary schools are hopefully spending you know, not too much time prepping for these tests and just seeing where these kids are at. And if some schools, if, if this is a valid measure, which is a whole different question, but if some schools are outperforming in basic math, others, are we doing things differently that we could learn? That's my question. But yes. So I mean, looking at the 
three years of data, which is not a very long time series, I'm not noticing, just looking subject by subject, level by ne level, um, I'm not noticing huge trends. Right? I think if I actually had the numbers and did the math, I would find a lot of them flat, you know, plus or minus their errors. And so I guess that that leads me to ask the question, if, if the district does spend substantial effort and time analyzing these and then you know, treats them as response, you know, response variables to our interventions, um, are, we, are we seeing changes? Um, that was one thought. The other thought I had was just looking at, so MCAS tests are high stakes in the high school, but um, I think for some students, MCAS tests, once, you're, once you get over the hurdle, there's no, there may not be a reward for increasing your MCAS score. Um, and, and it might, might even be uh, more valuable to you to focus on other things that happen and are offered at high school. And again, those are priorities that are established by the high school faculty, by the district leadership. And so I'm just wondering where those kind of decisions come into. Um, like you said, data indicates something about your practice, but then you have to examine it in light of your values in terms of what you do next. Um, just wondering, do any of these scores, um, especially, well, I think students with disabilities is, is, the, is the biggest question. Is that, is that reflective of practice? Is that something that's not responding to an intervention? Um, so a couple of things. Um, looking at these three-year trend lines, I want to call your attention to grades three and four in grades seven and eight, and tell me if they look different to you as I go through the different groups. So, do you see anything there? Grade seven in 2017 is really strong across the board, and I think there's some other grades like that. Is that what you're looking for? Well, when I look at it, what I see is it seems like there's a trend of progress in grades three and four, mm -hmm. and a, yep. a trend of regression in seven, in seven and eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, that was. I mean, obviously, I didn't know what was going to happen in, th in grade four and three or any of the grades this year. But when we made the decision to try to bring some of the elementary strategies to the middle school in our overall strategic plan for the budget last year, it was because we felt that the, the data was trending in a more positive direction in the elementary schools and a more negative direction in the middle school. Um, so I think you're right that if you did like just an average of all of them, it would somewhat net out, but I think it's because the gains in the elementary are being offset by losses at middle school. Um, so that's that piece. Um, when I look at students with disabilities, um, that I go again to the um, school by school comparison. Um, so if you look at, for example, um, Ryan Road School, and their students with disabilities, they're pretty close to the top of their group. Jackson Street is the same. Um, so I think there are some variations of the effectiveness of the special education interventions taking place in the different elementary schools. Um, they are different populations, too. I mean, they're sort of evening out to be more similar to each other. But um, I do think there's a difference there. Um, in Ryan Road in general, I think you see across the board, they tend to do um, better as compared to um, their peer schools and as compared to the other schools in the district. And there are some differences of practice there that uh, I think are uh, possibly 
possibly to um, account for that. One of the things that we've done sort of very consciously is a district improvement strategy this year, even though it's not in the plan, is had sort of a Ryan Road replication project in place at Leeds and at Bridge Street, um, trying to have their, whatever they call their, their student support team, model the practices that are being done at Ryan Road. Um, I saw actually uh, the psychologist at Ryan Road give a presentation at UMass last year um, in their special education teacher preparation program. It was um, actually, they're partially an advisory board program, so there are superintendents and special ed directors from across New England and special ed faculty from across New England there. And the um, process that they had developed at Ryan Road for really analyzing their data and intervening, I think is a cut above. Um, and, and really struck a lot of us as, as state-of-the-art practice. And so we've asked the other schools to, to replicate that. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing that um, coaches have noticed is the practices are, by and large, the same. That was the point of having a documented curriculum and having coaching. But there are little things that are being done at Ryan Road that I think make a big difference. For example, um, in the ELA data we're looking at, a lot of that is based on writing. And one of the practices that they've noticed is they have a um, drafting process that's sort of built in. And it actually has a motivational component to it. So they make students write out their response to whatever the prompt is longhand before they can type it in. Um, and so I don't think writing out longhand is the magic, but I think getting them to go through a drafting process as someone who used to be an English teacher, um, it really makes a difference. Um, and so trying to find those best practices that we can bring to other schools um, is, is how I would how I interpret it. So I don't think it's um, so I don't think it's a difference of curriculum. I don't think it's a difference of instruction. I think there are some differences of practice that we need to um, hone in on now. Yeah, I just, I, what you just said fits and just, if you were looking at this and you put big dots for the other three elementary schools, Ryan Road is really um, impressive on almost every measure where they fall. And so there's something good and then I can wait if somebody else has something on this, but I wanted to go back to where you asked us to compare seventh to eighth grade, but after somebody asks about this, it's fine. Could you just talk um, about the Hispanic Latino, and this isn't specific to Ryan Road, but it does seem like when we see how in the subgroups there actually is a, oftentimes a smattering, it does feel that the Hispanic group is one that stands out as um, our comparison schools are above us. To me, that's it's not just, and I, I yeah. we're on a Ryan Rose slide, but I really want to emphasize that this is not, no, it's I'm every not school. pointing, it's every change. school. It's every school. So I would like to just talk about that. Yeah. Jackson Street. Um, oh, they don't have one there. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Jackson Street. There. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you're the second member who's said that, and I think this is really great, um, because to me, this that is the story of this data. To me, that is the overwhelming story of the data. Um, our Hispanic and Latino subgroup is of these groups that you know has a, a sort of clear identity, one that's not an amalgam of something, uh, you know, other groups, or one that um, isn't already being addressed through our, our plans in special education. It's the largest subgroup. It's 18% of our kids, and um, it's where the biggest gap is. So um, you're interpreting the data for sure. And I mean, uh, there are some implications for practice that I'm going to talk about later. That's on. what I, OK. But um, yeah, yeah that, to me, that's it. And, and it doesn't matter what school. You can, and it actually even doesn't matter how high it is. Yeah. It's still relatively it's still the weakest relative. school. Yeah, exactly. Can, I mean, and I know that these cohorts are not the same through time, but again, what's interesting is that when you get to the high school, um, in ELA, that subgroup lags. In mathematics, it's right about in the center, and in science, it's at the very top. Yeah. So again, yeah. you know, 
this to me is interesting when you have things that disagree. Yes. Just wondering, again, it could be a different cohort, obviously, right? It is. It's a different, it's a different group of students starting in a different place and they're ending up in a different place. But is this is what's happening in the elementary schools the future that we're gonna see at the high school? Or is there something that goes on within their journey that changes their trajectory? Well, I, I think it's really important to remember that the 10th grade test is nothing like the 3 through 8th grade test. So yeah. there's a lot that's done with the threshold for passing. Um, so that, I think the high school will always outperform all the rest of the schools just because of that. Right. And it goes to the high stakes nature. I mean, it's only acceptable to have so many kids not getting a diploma. It's politically acceptable. I mean, educationally, it's not acceptable to have any kid not get a diploma. But um, the, the science trend is across grades. I mean, that's the area where we really don't see a large race-based achievement gap. Um, and fifth grade, eighth grade, and, and high school, that's where we have better equity. Um, so I think that it, there's something there. Um, I think in the future, that will likely continue to be one of our more equitable um, performance areas. Will you go to where you asked us to watch the seventh and eighth yeah. grade, just to one of those? Because I saw something. I just want to see if what I was looking at is consistent. Um, something maybe with a, I don't know, with the larger percentage of students, like non. Uh, like, uh, that's white students. Yeah, OK. We can look at this, and maybe the ones with not disabilities or something. Just So if you look at. Um, the white students, grade seven, the blue bar, okay? Yeah. It's that same cohort that then is in grade eight in the red bar. That's right. And if you watch this, I think what I see is that particular cohort that is the blue bar in grade seven, the red bar in grade eight, and off the scale in grade nine is an incredibly strong cohort through everything. Those are always high. And so it would... I think just suggest having caution about comparing what's going on there. If if my hypothesis is correct, that that's an outlier cohort of kids, but that's what I was noticing. No, I think that's that's very uh, that's a very good point. Um, I would just point out that the red bar in grade seven is the gold bar in grade eight. Yes. So. Yep. So there, there's something there that. I don't quite like. Um, Maybe look at a few. I, I see that blue and that red one is being really strong across that whole grade for some reason. But, but yeah, that that eighth that eighth grade group last year, which is now ninth grade, which is now a non-tested grade, was a, a high performing group all the way through. Right. So if if we're looking at classes around it that group might set the bar, sure. offset it, right? Interpret with caution. Yeah. Um, I feel like there was something else out there that I maybe didn't answer. Mr. Meyer, did you have another one that I didn't quite get to? I was just, I mean, again, you know, the thing for me is looking at data is always how, what is it show about success or failure in initiatives that have been undertaken leading up to this. Yeah. So, I mean, right, obviously these, a, lot of, a lot of these things have been flagged for years and obviously the district undertakes its best efforts and teachers are, you know, this is not the singular focus, but teachers right. are aware of this and it's one, it's one yardstick. Right. So when you look at this data and when your team and when, you know, teachers look at this data, what to them? What to them stands out? I mean, I, you know, I think of it as when I see data, if it, if I'm disappointed in it because I've been making a concerted effort to teach a particular, you know, part of the standards, or I can feel really happy about, oh, look, you know, my department met and we decided we were going to do writing, and so look, the kids did much better on the open response questions. Right. So, a uh, couple, couple of responses to that. So just picking one of these, um, again, I'll go to 
how narrow the range is actually. So if each item is two scaled score points, we're really talking about the difference of five questions on the test being the worst school up there to the best school up there. So um, not over interpreting where you fall within that when the range is small is one thing um, that I, I think is important to bear in mind. Um, the other is all of this violates kind of the one of the main statistical um, premises, <laughs> at least as most of us were trained, which is trying to, to distinguish noise from a true signal, right? And a lot of these um, things are all bumping around an average, right? Which is only separated by a few responses. So um, not getting, not over interpreting individual things, but looking for trends. And so when we look at it, as, as the administrative leadership team, um, the two things that really jumped out to us were Hispanic and Latino students in that gap, because that's a gap where we see lots of places where the white kids are at the top of our peers and the Hispanic and Latino kids are at the bottom. And it's like, it doesn't matter what grade, what school, what subject. So that looks like a true signal to us. The other thing that looks like a true signal to us is the, um, the fact that that's not present in science. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time talking about well, what could be the reason for that. And we have two hypotheses that we're working with right now. One is um, that there's just a much more language support embedded into science classes because typically the vocabulary is new for everybody. Um, so in other courses, teachers may be going along without supporting the vocabulary as much. Um, but in science, you almost have to stop and define and, and, and um, introduce new vocabulary. I'll, sometimes it's in a third language that um, none of the students speak. So that's one thing. The other thing is that um, it, at least in our curriculum, which is uh, mystery science in the, in the elementary schools and then lab science in middle and high, it's much more hands-on. Um, so kids can manipulate it. They can see what's happening. Um, they have an opportunity to really um, have an authentic experience with the content rather than having it mediated through language or through text. Um, so, yeah, I, when we talk about this, um, where our Hispanic students are performing, and like I do want to talk about it as a big picture. I do want to look at it in the context of are they. Uh, are they in the classroom? What is our attendance rate? What are our disciplinary rates? We're only monitoring um, in school suspensions, but what about the kids who are being asked to leave the classroom or just walking out? Like, we're not aware of that data. I don't know how well we're tracking it. Um, and so I would like to really be paying attention to that. I would like to be making sure our expectations are the same for all students um, and that the support is the same. Um, and I also, as far as the, the science grades, I was talking to my children about it, and one of the things that they brought up was um, that there, you know, we do so much as far as um, to close the experience gap in science. You know, we take them on walking trips. Crimson and Clover Farm is like, you know, a field trip that they go on. We've got the gardens. Um, the NEF has funded so many projects where they go out to um, Arcadia. And so that, you know, if, if, it's, if part of the achievement gap is also an experience gap, then I think that we've done a lot to bridge that in the area of science more so than um, in other subjects, perhaps. And so I wonder if that plays into it. Well, I think it does. I mean, I, those experiences that you described, I guess I interpret slightly different. I interpret them as hands-on and, you know, right. experiential learning um, that, that I think is able to connect with students who may have difficulty if the only way to get to the content is through a text that they might have trouble reading or language they may have trouble interpreting. Just looking back at the, the Hispanic Latino subgroup, I think it's really hard to interpret it without going a little bit deeper and saying, well, within that subgroup, there's a percentage of those students who are in these other groups, high needs, non-high needs, student with disability, 
and not disabled. So for example, if for whatever reason the Hispanic Latino subgroup had more high needs, I'll just pick high needs students in it, right, than some of the other subgroups, you might, there, there, there's other effects that aren't being controlled for. Sure. I'm the, I mean, economic disadvantage is a major one in our district. And, and, and so it's just part of the story there. And, and On this, do we have, um, is this data, this, again, would it look the same if it was something else like grades or, um, you know, portfolios or, you know, whatever sort of, you know, evidence of the work kids are doing in school? So I can answer that question only from the context of one study we did, where we were looking at um, where we were looking at formative assessments and grades on report cards, and we found that there really wasn't a strong um, relationship between the grades kids were getting on assessments and what they were receiving on the report card. Um, so my what I would take away from that study is that um, if you looked at report card grades, they'd probably be more similar than these um, these assessment scores here. More, more similar. What do you yes. mean by that? More what similar. I mean, to <laughs> there would be mostly all A's and B's, no matter what subgroup you're in. In high school. High school and middle school. High school and middle school. Yeah, but, I mean, I, the reason I sort of asking this question is I just I don't do it anymore. But I used to take a whole lot of tests, and my impression, my own subjective impression, was. The test. Sometimes I did better than what I knew, and sometimes I did worse than what I knew. But it was pretty, like you could draw for my on my on my test taking. You could draw a pretty good scatter plot in terms of <laughs> comparing my score to what I really knew, my score to what I really knew. You know, they were very seldom actually lined up where what I knew matched my score. Usually, what I knew was either more or less. You know, depending on the test, and, and you know, in other words, I. And, and you know, and I can picture that that would all get evened out for a group unless an entire group tended to test showing that they knew more than what they really knew or showing that they knew less than what they really knew. So, you know, I'm kind of skeptical. Um, did, I'm assuming you looked at like growth percentiles, the student growth percentiles for? Yeah, I, I did look at the growth percentiles and growth percentiles are great. And I should say this, I mean, you really should say this, not to get lost in it. Um, we have an accountability system, and the accountability system says the district is fine, the schools are fine. The one school that um, has an accountability um, rating right now is the middle school, and it's for their EL subgroup only. Um, so, and in fact, the middle school exceeded its goal for its EL subgroup last year, but um, is still identified as in need of improvement with their EL subgroup because they started. So um, these are schools that for the most part are hitting their targets, right? It's just that compared to other schools, we know that more growth is possible. And that's the reason I do this, because if you're, if you're the school that happens to be the top dot there, which in some cases we're the school that's the top dot, having a goal that says, okay, you're gonna increase another 2% next year, to me, it may not really be that valid, right? Because if none of the other schools like you has ever done it, what's the reason to believe that it's even possible to do, right? Um, so I, I do need to say that. In the, in the context, of, context of the overall accountability rating, the district and the schools are doing fine with the exception of the middle school that has the um, accountability rating for the EL subgroup. But the data shows I think um, where we need to go. Um, I think it shows where we have the the equity gaps within our own district. I know equity is a very important goal for the district, and you know it. It just I personally kind of drives me crazy when we're able to demonstrate in a lot of ways that our Hispanic and Latino students aren't thriving to the way our other students are. That we don't really talk about that too much. And what, what what can be done for that? Can we talk about the scatter plot for the about the middle school a little bit? Just I'm curious about what you said at the beginning about how middle schools perform differently. They did look, especially compared to our elementary schools, they did look like they were 
doing worse. You can see that the subgroups are in English and math are at the bottom, you know, what we were describing before at the bottom, whereas other groups, especially in English, are at the top. Science, they're doing a little better, except for Hispanic and Latino again. So I just was curious about your thoughts. On so my, that. I mean, what I was saying is when you compare <laughs> the districts in our school to the peer group in the statewide average, the middle school is pretty much worse on everything, right? But when you compare the middle school to its peer middle schools like this, um, here's ELA in three of these groups, which are very large subgroups, we're the top performing middle school for non-disabled, non-high needs, white students. You know, that's about as good as it gets for a middle school like ours. Um, for math, some progress still to go, but firmly in the middle for those those subgroups. Um, it's the other subgroups where we're at the bottom. So um, what I was saying is this is, the, this is the demonstration of the difference between middle school and elementary schools. Um, so compared to the elementary schools, it does not perform well. But compared to other middle schools, it does perform well, I would say. Not the best, but certainly not the worst. Not like you would be, might be led to believe if you were just looking at the K to 8 graphs. So, yes. I'm just going to offer a slightly uh, varied um, or, or, or potentially different perspective on something you just said, Dr. Provost, which is I think we could always do better. Um, I think these compares, and, and I understand what you're saying, and, and yes, it's very important to get all the subgroups here that aren't performing toward the middle and upper end of our comparison schools to figure out how to move those up. but. I don't think that needs to be instead of or um, separated from saying any of these subgroups could improve. And in some ways, I think when you improve the experience for everyone, it's po any of the subgroups, it's possible for everybody to improve. And when I look at these subgroups of school, like the, cat, the other districts that were compared to, I know on paper there's reasons that we've been picked to be compared to them, but I also feel like our community really values education and we really value what's going on in the schools and, and that isn't part of those choices and I just want us to have maybe higher expectations and, and feel like we can get everybody better still. I, I'm not saying that we can't yeah. improve. Yeah. I'm saying, well, they may, there may be one school that, I mean, I've said this before, it would be hard for me to imagine Ryan Road getting much stronger, you know, based on it being at the top of all of its peer schools. I'm sure it will. And the principal yeah. would disagree with me. The principal would say, we can always get better. Um, but so when I'm you agreeing with the principal. Right. Okay. But I just say, when, when I see something like this where you're already at the top, I think that the opportunity for growth, put it this way, is less than when you have a group that's at the bottom. I think the opportunity for growth is very much more so there. Is it, I, I, can't, my, I can't see it as well, but the, um, is, it, is it Amesbury or Lemonstory that seems to be at the top of every one of those categories? Uh, this one it's I think is Amesbury. Yeah, Amesbury, yeah. And I'm talking like top of non disabled and disabled. Yeah. I think it's Amesbury. <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't tell the shade of red whether yeah. it's Lemonster or Amesbury. Yeah. So clearly, there's a school that's doing well in all categories. Right. And Amesbury is, I don't know, Southern New Hampshire. It's like a, it's like right up on the border. It's a small, small city. <laughs> it's like five thousand. <laughs> but somehow, it's still a comparable. Yeah. School, so. What's up? But why? It's just so interesting to me how they choose these comparative schools. That's why I was yeah. sort of asking what you're. It's the makeup for. of the student population. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I understand from a yeah. basic level, but if it's a population of five thousand students, or five thousand people, sorry, you know, or whatever, I don't know. So it's interesting to look at that. Just moving us along here. Any ideas you have for implications about practice?
I mean, I don't, I don't know if I have something to say about the implications of practice, but I do feel that um, I know that at JFK, having more Hispanic teachers in the classroom just feels uh, like it would support students because we know that research suggests that we want to see people like ourselves demonstrating, you know, what we're trying to do too. So that feels like a, a smart investment. And that's something that was negotiated in the, the last contract. We have the ESP to teacher career ladder. Um, I was at the educating or diversifying the educator workforce coalition meeting on Monday, and I think we're in a really good position to have that that embedded within our contract. Um, now the challenge will be to fill up the pipeline and and get ESPs working on that. Um, so um, that is part of the part of the alt team this year. The other thing will be once we get students through the end of the pipeline, we do have a couple of districts that are um, a little bit farther ahead of us. This will be retaining them um, because uh, they're some of the districts that are having more success attracting more diverse candidates are now running into some considerable challenges with retention. So we can benefit from their experience. We can think about what they've learned to try to make sure that not only can we get our um, people credentialed, but we can keep them in the district. And you mean, just, I'm just curious to follow up, do you mean just in JFK or having more Hispanic I just, I, across the board? I mean, across the board, of yeah. I just noticed okay. it at JFK when I was. That there are I, more Hispanic and Latino? Yes. Teachers. Um. When we look at improving the performance of some of these subgroups, I thought that at one point there were some grants available for year-round programming for some summer programming to support students so that there wasn't as much learning loss over the summer. There was. So we received a grant for ELLs, um, and we do provide summer programming for them. Um, again, that is a very small subgroup within the subgroup of um, Hispanic and Latino, and a lot of our ELLs are not Hispanic or students, um, so they would not necessarily help with that. We do have um, $10,000 that we got last year. It's part of the turnaround grant, focused again on ELLs at JFK. I was notified today that we'll have $20,000 to put towards turnaround efforts for ELLs at JFK this year, um, so we'll still do that. Those are, those are really targeted. Um, uh, so we'll definitely put that into part of a comprehensive package of reforms. Is that something that you think expanding, like have you seen results of those targeted interventions? I mean, is that something that would really be worth expanding upon? Well, we, we, as I said, we exceeded our expectations at the middle school, or the state's expectations at middle school for our EL subgroup. So there definitely was an impact. Um, I don't think that the, those interventions would be appropriate for all of these subgroups because many of the uh, individuals in the subgroup are not ELs and so you wouldn't do EL strategies with students who... Right, but I'm saying using the summer to provide additional learning. Oh, yeah, so expanded learning time is, um, is a strategy that's often used. I think that um, we would be challenged. I don't see a funding source to do um, expanded learning time for the subgroup to be put on it. Um, I do think it probably would have some effect, some positive effect, um, but but I don't think I don't think we, we have the resources to do that, unless it's a, a group that also happens to fall into the ELL subgroup where we do have money for them, or the students with disabilities subgroup who does have money for some programming. But it still leaves a large group of um, students who wouldn't. Be eligible for any of those summer programs, but definitely something to think about. I mean, I think going back to what Ms. Fallon had said about the opportunities of um, hands-on opportunity and experiential learning in the sciences needs to be spread out into the other subject areas, and you know, there's rich language-based activities, and and I think that there's a lot of really interesting work that's being. I mean, especially, I, I would imagine that we'll see changes with the um, 
with math investigations as well since it was updated. And I mean, it's only been a year, but I, I think that we should be seeing some interesting. It's a great. I mean, I, I was I was at the um, leading for leading for diversity or leading for access and equity conference today, and just about every strategy they talked about was more hands on, more experiential, more real world, centering the student in the in the learning. And and I think in, you know empowering them to be engaged with their learning. I was thinking the other thing about science. A lot of times science is really related to your general knowledge, the, the stuff you bring just from your life experience in, in a way that sometimes English language and math isn't. It's not so directly. So it might be in the other direction. Though it's not so much that the learning needs to be um, experiential, but that the learning needs to be tied to the experiences that kids have already had. Yeah, um, just to share an example from a session I was at, it was a, one of the sessions I went today was um, building greater ac equity into math courses. Um, and so they were showing an example, a traditional example of um, me methods of finding the center of a triangle. And then um, they showed what they were doing at this new curriculum in Boston Public Schools. Um, and the it was the same standard. It was trying to find the center of the triangle. But the context of the problem was they went back to the time when the BPS decided to move their, their central office to Roxbury. And so part of the math problem was about, is that truly a more geographically centered location within the city? And so they were able to do the math around that. But then the second part of it was bringing in all of um, the controversy that happened at the time, like people who said, I refuse to go to the, the central office if it's going to be in Roxbury. And then, so that piece became such a hook for the students and really, you know, to me, made a lesson about um, central tendencies within triangles that the kids are going to remember for a long time. So, yeah, it's exactly that. So just to add another personal story, seeing this, you know, if you had a, let's say we had a separate subgroup up here, uh, middle school um, uh, baseball players, and they're doing poor in math or something, right, whoever they are, um, you might talk to that group and find out they really like baseball. That wouldn't be surprising I made the group up that way, right? But, um, and you might think about, okay, there's all these great examples in baseball that you can talk about things. And and maybe if we looked at certain groups and thought, okay, what what are some common um, typical interests? And you're not gonna get everybody under your umbrella, but as an example, I, I when I was a grad student, I, I tutored an older gentleman who really wanted to get his high school equivalent and couldn't and because of the math. And I was trying to teach him fractions. And then I found out he liked the Red Sox. And, okay, we stopped doing fractions of recipes and pies, and we started doing batting percentages, and, you know, he flourished. And I think that's just building on what people are saying, but maybe we have a small enough community where some of these small groups of kids who are maybe getting extra help in math, we could really try to um, find that baseball thing for them, whatever it is, you know. I'm sure the teachers do do that, but I agree. I guess I just am always concerned with MCAS about, and with all, you know, standardized testing is just all that built in kind of cultural bias. And it really goes back to exactly what you're describing of that's great if it's, um, you know, batting percentages, but, or it's great if it's a language that, you know, a kid understands because they're in the Northampton schools and we've tailored it that way. But then we know when they're taking the MCAS, how does that work against them? So I really thought your point about, science being really introducing um, terms and language, maybe that is kind of giving them a little bit more of an even, um, you know, uh, grounding, whereas in, you know, in what is, what's happening in English and math where they're maybe not, they don't have the language skills, whether it, because they're ELL or maybe they're not, they come from a different place. So, you know, how does that kind of factor into all of this? I think it's just important to... Or, or Maybe they don't see themselves in um, 
maybe they don't see themselves in the curriculum. You know, mm -hmm. I remember uh, walking in not that long ago to a classroom, I hate to say, in our district that had, um, had a, a bunch of disengaged kids and it was of mice and men. I just said, I know this is a ninth grade class, right? Because that's what we do in ninth grade. It doesn't matter that nobody really relates to the book anymore, but we keep teaching it. Um, so there's that too. I mean, you can make you can make literacy more relevant by really. I mean, that even is easier than baseball. It's like you know, what are you reading now? What do you want to read? You know, who are your authors? Um, do they are there are there books that give kids um, mirrors? of themselves instead of just windows into someone else's lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. But again, if you, I mean, if you look at the bio curriculum, I mean, obviously as a teacher, you're trying to relate it to the students. But if you look at the bio on CAS, there's not a lot of stuff that you encounter every day. I mean, there's, it's, it's mostly, you know, trophic levels and DNA sequences and I don't know whether, you know, the thing about the fact that there is a level playing field, that this is more of a second language and that kids coming in, you know, mm -hmm. maybe don't see themselves as disadvantaged or, you know, because it is alien, it is something that's different. Because um, I, you know, I, I'm, again, I'm surprised because I know the districts choose to do physics first because their students have weaker ELA profiles. And so they choose to do, so, you know, they say, okay, well, we know that there's going to be a lot, like they go away from biology because it's so vocabulary heavy. So again, that's why it's, to me, it's sort of a puzzle that we're having our kids have this degree of success, even, you know, in those, those groups that aren't as successful on ELA. Well, we see it also in fifth grade and eighth grade, which is just general science, basically. Um, so yeah, and maybe there are other reasons. Maybe that's not the thing. And certainly, I'm not looking to change anything about science because that's the area where we say, okay, let's not break it. That seems to be working. Um, and it, it may be that in some areas the intervention is trying to make it more hands-on and in other places saying, this is already hands-on enough. Um, let's just keep doing what we're doing. I would be interested to see what some of our um, community outreach and community building activities do as far as um, some of the some of the success of our students and um, you know some of the programs like mailing books to reluctant readers over the summer. I mean, I think that some of those programs that cost very little money actually had a pretty big impact on some students, um, and I feel like uh, because of the nature of the funding cycle um, for the Education Foundation, you get three years and then it kind of gets dropped. We don't actually see a long-term impact with a lot of them. Um, so I do hope that we kind of stick with some of these um, some of these programs that, um, that I think do provide a valuable service and, you know, outreach over the summer and, and contact with families um, and reading um, that I think really are important for some of our students that might not otherwise have the opportunity. I think that we need to be building those relationships and going out to the community more than we do. Um, Saving so that, just two things. One is that um, the NEF had funded for a number of years the reading teacher at Ryan Road to uh, do direct um, work in the community. Um, I was thinking about that as well, how how important that work was and watching her with the families was, was you know, just an outstanding, um, again, I'm not saying that the other schools aren't doing that, it's just that I know that one. <laughs> um, and then you sort of asked us what we felt, but I guess the, the other piece to this, of course, is, um, you know, what the teachers know and say about the complicated and the nuances of teaching these different subjects. You know, what is the difference between teaching biology and, I mean, writing English language arts is an enormous <laughs> body of work. And, um, you know, just getting 
kids to write two sentences, you know, anybody, me included, side by side that connect and make sense. And I mean, it's that's a really nuanced thing. And you know, you sort of asked us what we think, but it's really hard not to. I'm sure that the teachers are digging into this and thinking about their practice and thinking, you know. So again, I sort of put it back that I would love to hear also what the teachers are are thinking about in their own uh, professionalism. Sure. So I can't speak for all the teachers. Yeah, obviously. of course. Um, <laughs> I can say that this um, exact same presentation is was shared with the principals and they'll be talking about it with their faculty and so some of those conversations are starting. At middle school, the, some of the conversation is a little bit further along because they're in the midst of the turnaround and there's a natural connection between this and their, their turnaround efforts. Um, at the middle school, you know, one of the things that we are trying to do again, trying to incorporate from elementary is more of a um, workshop model for literacy because that provides more opportunities for choice in reading. And you know, I have, what I understand the research to say about reading is it doesn't really matter as long as it's a book and as long as you're doing it every single day, it will be helpful. Um, and so trying to take a model that provides more choice that may induce students to be more likely to read. And that track is, do we have any plans to, um, ask maybe high school students like an exit interview to ask them to reflect on their years in public education and think about you know report back sort of what worked and what didn't work and what seemed like a waste of time and what seemed like really productive and you know those kind of because my guess is a lot of them will have will be able to tell you about about a class that was a waste or a class that was or, or a time and they'll educational career where they didn't really feel like they were connected. Yeah, that's a great idea. We don't have any plans for that, but I wrote it down because I, I do think we get some data from that. Yes, yes. And just echoing, I, I like that idea a lot, and I, I actually think kids leaving JFK would be capable of yeah. talking about their experience at JFK and, and getting back to just some of these subgroups even, you know? If that if we want to improve performance where it's the weakest and really needs the improvement, talking to those subgroups and saying, what could have made something more interesting or accessible to you? Maybe we'll learn something. For that matter, you could ask the uh, rising sixth graders. <laughs> I'm just curious when you talked uh, when we looked at the data and sort of that trend line from third to fourth improving. If you think. You know, if just looking back the past couple of years with RTI, if maybe, I don't know if it quite reaches, I don't know if the timing's quite right, but if maybe that had some kind of impact, do you think? I also wonder with the grant, the early childhood grant that we got, what kind of impact that will have moving forward. I mean, we've made some kind of improvements in the last couple of years in those younger grades, I feel like that maybe have had. I mean, that's my hope. So I'm hoping that this, stuff we're seeing here is the beginning of a trend you know it's mm -hmm. it's early but I'm hoping that we're going to see continued increasing strength in third and fourth and hopefully that carries to the fifth grade this year you know the, the kids who are in third grade last year are kids who would have had two years of of uh, math investigations three they're kids who would have had two years of inclusion support the kids who would have had RTI from the beginning of their experience. Mm -hmm. So we're getting into cohorts that have seen all of those interventions. So mm -hmm. I'm really hoping, I mean, that's why I look at that, the third grade and the fourth grade with, um, you know, as encouraging signs for what the future may be. Um, and that's why we've already decided we're going to try some of this stuff in middle school. Mm -hmm. And then oh, I'm also just curious about how you kind of, um, how sort of the, those interventions and all the other testing that we do um, intersects with MCAS scores. So that when you say like, what are, when we look at MCAS and we say, what are the implications for moving forward that we're not taking just, I mean, obviously we have a whole body of data on our students. So I would imagine this is just one piece of data, right? That's right. I think very important. Right. So, you know, if, we had this information that said we 
we seem to have a problem with performance of our Hispanic and Latino students, but we had all these other pieces of data that said lead, led us to believe, no, the kids are fine, mm -hmm. then I would say, well, there's something wrong with the test. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have other pieces of data. Mm -hmm. We looked at the discipline data. We looked at, um, I mean, when I just look at just my anecdotal data in discussions with principals and discussions with teachers of who's not doing well, it's, it's often the subgroup. So I think in this case, the test reflects that reality. Um, so I, I think it's, a for me, not, not just a function of the test. I mean, there, there are all kinds of problems with the test. In this year's 10th grade test, particularly, <laughs> that was problematic, right? But exactly. I, I think when you have a set of signals that lines up with other signals you're also getting, then okay. it's time to pay attention. Yeah, I agree. You have screenings as well. Can you say a little bit about, um, I think we, we have a new math interventionist kind of program at JFK this year. I don't know how many students it's serving. Um, and do you have a sense if that's going to affect some of these subgroups and be helpful, not just in MCAS, but in general? Yeah. So we are in the second round of intervention right now. Um, we did a group of sixth graders. Um, I can tell you that the, our goal was to have 80% of the students after one round of intervention be able to discontinue the intervention and we were able to meet that. So we've started with a second group. Um, I do think we, we have a little bit of a problem with the way it's working at sixth grade, which is it's a little bit short. Um, it's a, a sixth week intervention now and I'd like to get it up to 10 weeks um, but still for the first group we felt okay about um, discontinuing with the kids that we um, I can tell you that the students who are being um, identified for that intervention are very reflective of the subgroup we've been talking about tonight so I think that, that I'm happy to see them getting the extra help and I'm, I'm very happy that it is designed as extra help, so it's a second dose. Students aren't missing any of their classroom math in order to receive extra math. They're missing their um, unified arts class, um, which isn't a great trade-off either, but it's a better trade-off than missing math to get help in math. Um, so I think that that, I think that we will see, you know. In reality, we had two positions in the budget we could have used to. We definitely could have filled two interventionists um, table with um, kids who could have used the help. So um, it probably will be not as effective as it could be this this first time around. I think that next time we might be able to make changes that will make it more effective. Having the intervention block will hopefully allow us to do longer cycles next year. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about it, and this is really important, um, the types of kids who are receiving the intervention now, um, the interventionist described to me as kids who would raise nobody's red flags about needing help. Um, and I think that's really important because that tells me those are exactly the types of kids who are falling through the cracks. Um, so um, I'm hopeful. Is there any sort of um, assessment in place sort of when they go into that, when they come out, or even just teacher impressions or any? Are we keeping track of, so we'll have a way of saying the effect of it? There's two assessments they do. Um, they do one that's, um, I would say, more of a curriculum-based measure called the um, math recovery assessment. And then they use Ames Web and they do the concepts and application scale from the Ames Web. Um, I can say the results have been that these are kids who have pretty solid computational skills. Um, they can do the operations, they can do them even fairly fluently and accurately, but um, have some significant breakdowns with problem solving. And more than that, with confidence, with just um, being willing to, to start down a problem solving path and see where it leads. Um, and so what, what the intervention has, been, the intervention has been talking to me about is really building up the student's um, risk-taking muscle, if you will, by giving them opportunities to try things in a smaller group and see where it leads. And 
um, then sharing that back with the classroom teacher and saying, okay, this is, this is how you get the student started on a strategy. You know, if you can lead them down the first step or two, they'll be fine for the rest. Um, so I, I'm hoping that that communication between the interventionist and the classroom teacher will be helpful too. Okay, so then I just want to share with you my ideas about um, implications for practice. We already talked about a bunch of them, but I wanted to talk to you about um, equity-minded priorities. And this is a first attempt, um, and this came from the Peas concert, uh, not concert, Black Eyed Peas concert. <laughs> <laughs> Which you went to last week. <laughs> the Peas uh, conference, uh, and the the session I, a couple of sessions I attended with Estella Bensimon, um, who is really, um, her expertise is um, increasing achievement for Hispanic and Latino students. Uh, and she works both at the pre-K to 12 space as well as the higher ed space. Um, and so I had an opportunity to um, go to the, the breakfast session she did and also go to her keynote later on in the day. And she said something at the beginning uh, of the breakfast session that kind of blew my mind. And so I'll just share it with you. And she said that in her work with educators, she encourages her teachers not to look at students as individuals, but as races. And I just like, I was like, I said that that goes against everything I've been trained in, uh, and but I was one of the only white educators in the room, and that statement had been made, and we were still there, and so and she's the expert, so I figured, okay, I'm going to just go along with this and see what happens. And so she talked about um, an intervention she's currently doing with some uh, community college professors. And the problem they were trying to solve is math achievement for um, Hispanic and Latino students in community colleges. And so she said to the, the teachers, send me your rank book electronically or whatever. And then she sent it back to them and blanked out their students' names and just substituted races for students' names. And then she said, now we're going to look for patterns, because you'll see some things that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And one of the patterns they saw was that the students, the Latinx students, had the best attendance of any other group by race and had the lowest passing rate. And the reason why was because of homework. Um, and so they did a little intervention. They said, let's just try doing the first math problem together as, in a, as a class before you end the class. And that little intervention was enough hurdle help to dramatically increase passing rates. Um, but she said, if we had just been looking at these as individual kids and what did the, you know, what does we need for this kid or that kid, we wouldn't have seen that there was a, a race-based difference in performance that needed a specific intervention. Um, and so she calls that having equity-minded priorities instead of just um, your typical priorities. Normally, when districts look at their scores, they look at, in the aggregate, where did they do better, where did they do worse? Um, so one of the things that I've done trying to build on that work and, and apply the lessons of the conference is work with our coaches on some equity-minded priorities for what, uh, where we should put our efforts. So that's what I'd just like to share with you. This is a first attempt to get through these slides of what equity-minded priorities would look like. So we look at third grade ELA, it's writing. Writing is heavily sampled. It doesn't really matter what group um, students belong to, but they need to, they need to improve their writing skills. And so I've asked coaches, focus on that, third, third grade teachers. In math, you see something interesting. These are not standards, these are skills. skills in a way that are easy enough for people to relate to standards. But um, if you look at equity-minded priorities, or let me just say this, let's do it the other way. If you look at non-equity-minded priorities, you look at third grade math, we are above the state average pretty much 
all the way down the line in all of the individual items. So you could say there's nothing to focus on. You know, just general keep doing what you're doing, but try to do it better. But if you look specifically at our Latinx students, fractions and distributive property are much lower than the rest of the state and much lower than their subgroup. So it's something about the way we're doing that. And I've asked them, let's make that a priority. Even though you would say it shouldn't be a priority for us in the aggregate, we know that we have an identifiable group of students that's not doing well with those skills. So let's just focus on those and make sure we, we do a good job of teaching them to everybody. Um, so again, fourth grade ELA, um, writing comes up as an equity-minded priority, figurative language for everybody. But again, again, you see the same thing in fourth grade. If you look at fourth grade in the aggregate, you could say there's nothing really to prioritize. Um, but if you look at an equity-minded priority, if you look at, so what are our Hispanic and Latino students struggling with? It's fractions, and it's representing verbal statements as equations. It comes out so strongly when you look at it on the basis of race, but when you look at it, the aggregate, it doesn't even show up at all because all the rest of the students wash it out. Um, and so, I don't want to belabor the point, but you have the same thing going on all the way down the line through eighth grade. Um, in some cases, the equity-minded priority and the non-equity-minded priority would be the same, but in some cases, um, we would have different priorities based by looking through equity lenses and so that's what I've asked um, our coaches to focus on. When, it's this, when you have things that are obviously high for both, that would be you know, the best thing to do. But just because something doesn't show up as a weakness in the aggregate doesn't mean we shouldn't also really take a second look at it and make sure we're teaching it as well as we can um, to all students. So those are, that's our first attempt at coming up with some equity-minded priorities. And that's, um, and, but again, Doing it, you know, not, look, I'm looking at seventh grade, multiplying, dividing integers. Doing it not just by giving more worksheets on multiplying and dividing integers, but doing it in a way that can be engaging, doing it in a way that can really reach students, um, trying to find different ways of teaching those skills to really bring more students in. Um, those are sort of the implications for practice that we're looking at. So that's what I have. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, so um, we have future business and meeting dates. Um, Rules and Policy Subcommittee, November 13th, 2019, 515 in the superintendent's office. And then we have our school committee meeting of November 14th at 645 here in the JFK community room. And then our next meeting, which includes the student advisory committee at 615 um, at uh, December 12th, 2019 in the community room. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? That does mean that the October 24th, 2019 school committee is adjourned. Thank you.